Give a guy a gun, and he's Superman. Give him two, and he's God. Using two guns at once is impractical, unrealistic, and generally a liability. And yet, we see pistols akimbo in many action-oriented games. So how did such a reckless regard for accuracy originate? What was the first video game that introduced two-pistol gunplay? And how on earth do you reload when both your hands are full? Carrying multiple weapons was once an issue of practicality. With early flintlock pistols taking quite some time to reload, pirates such as Blackbeard would not be seen with a brace of fewer than six such sidearms ready to fire. By the time of the Old West, revolvers were the norm, and some cowboys will have carried more than one, for those situations where a single six-shooter simply won't do. Such backup weapons were used singly to avert a lengthy reload, however. Firing a weapon from each hand with wild abandon, probably reserved for desperados with nothing to lose. The blame for dual wield popularity today lies squarely at the feet of cinema. With the popularity of westerns aligned with the rise of the action film of the 1970s, it was only a matter of time. Action films are not noted for their subtlety, and firepower was one trait not often spared. Dirty Harry's 44 Magnum was described as the most powerful handgun in the world. And so what better way to up the ante than to double down on a second pistol? In the 1969 film, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid each employ a pair of Colt single-action army revolvers in a daring shootout while fleeing from the Bolivian police. Another more prominent use of dual wielding in a western film is the outlawed Josie Wales from 1976. Featuring Clint Eastwood as the titular character, a wanted man driven by vengeance, and a need for firepower that only pistols akimbo might provide. The 1970s also marks the earliest days of electronic entertainment. The popularity of Pong from 1972 spurred development of the arcade game industry, some of which offered crude digital representations of popular culture at the time. Video games with a western flavour were inevitable. Gunfight in 1975 was the first, a simple shooting game with players 1 and 2 facing off in a six-shooter duel. One of the earliest depictions of dual-wielded pistols in a video game is in an arcade title from 1979 called Sheriff, an early Nintendo game published by Exidy. Clearly taking cues from the western movies of its era, this multi-directional shooter featured bandits clearly seen swinging two pistols. It was none other than Shigeru Miyamoto that was responsible for Sheriff's artwork, so the mind behind Mario and Zelda might also be behind the very first video game to feature dual-wielded pistols. The Western's popularity saw decline by the end of the 70s, with Star Wars in 1977 prompting a shift towards space shooters, like the phenomenally popular Space Invaders in 1978. There remained a few Western-influenced games, however, and titles such as Gunsmoke on the NES applied a familiar frontier theme to the well-rehearsed scrolling shooter genre. One suitably named swan song of the Western spike in popularity was the four-player run-and-gun action of Sunset Riders in 1991. With some parallels to the 1985 film Silverado, one of the characters on offer makes use of two revolvers simultaneously. This is perhaps to position the character as a Billy the Kid derivative, rash and impetuous through youth, but otherwise boasting legendary gun skill. The neon-tinged 80s saw the displacement of westerns in favour of the blockbuster action film, and one man had influence outweighing any other, John Woo. His brand of high-octane gunfight was fuelled by acrobatic display, bottomless magazines, and flagrant use of guns akimbo. A Better Tomorrow in 1985 was the first outing of dual pistols in a John Woo film, but it certainly wasn't the last. Hard Boiled in 1992 was his breakthrough hit in the West, marking Wu's transition to Hollywood and proving particularly influential in other media. Chow Yun Fat features his inspector to kill a Yen, an undercover cop who's not afraid to get his hands dirty, an anti hero with a total disregard for authority. It was around this time that the foundations of the first person shooter genre were laid. Id's Wolfenstein 3D was released the same year. With Doom's release in 1993, the now familiar format of gun-focused gameplay with a first-person view had taken hold. And with the influence of cinema, it wouldn't be long before we would see a game featuring Wu-esque gunplay. Typical. You wait ages for a first-person shooter featuring dual wielding, and then two come along at once. Bungie's Marathon and Apogee's Rise of the Triad were both released on the 21st of December 1994. Bungie are better known today for the Halo series and the forthcoming Destiny. 
but back in the day, they were champions of the Macintosh platform, providing an answer to the IBM compatible's Doom. Unlike the paper-thin storyline behind Doom, Marathon was replete with lore. Such attention to detail is something Bungie would build much of their reputation on. The gameplay was no slouch, however. The action was polished and as visceral as any competitor. Doom might have the edge in notability, but perhaps only by grace of platform choice. Rise of the Triad was released the same day as Marathon, and is perhaps more explicitly influenced by John Woo. Dual pistols feature much more prominently. Whilst you start the game with a single pistol, you need to take only a few steps forward to be bestowed with a second. Clearly this is not a game that takes itself too seriously. Between the ludicrous jibs, jump pads and magical weapons, Rise of the Triad does much to establish an exaggerated nature. And within this scope, dual wielding feels relatively mild. The full version wouldn't see release until February 1995, but by grace of its initial shareware release, both Rise of the Triad and Marathon share the trophy for being the first FPS game to feature dual-wielded firearms. Marathon had an inevitable sequel in Marathon 2 Durandal in 1995, a game which featured akimbo shotguns with flip-cocking action, and a terrifying portent of what the future of the Call of Duty series held. The crypt-robbing Lara Croft's signature weapons in 1996's Tomb Raider are a pair of pistols perhaps picked for potency when facing off against prehistoric peril. Or perhaps just for the cool factor, otherwise to cover for a lack of Lara's ability to aim. The shamefully underrated FPS Blood by Monolith in 1997 featured guns akimbo as a power-up, and would double the firepower of almost any of the weapons on offer, even the rocket launcher. By 1998, hardware-accelerated graphics were rapidly becoming the norm, and with a greater ability to push polygons came a surge in the sheer number of first-person shooter games released. Unreal Tournament was certainly one of the better ones, an expansion on the original Unreal's multiplayer aspect, with an emphasis on fast-paced and competitive action. The starting weapon was a tad feeble compared to most of the Arsenal's offerings, but should you pick up two enforcers, your available firepower was doubled. At the turn of the new millennium, John Woo's influence had saturated the interactive art forms, but the march of special effects and CGI opened the doors for a film with perhaps far greater impact. Enter the Matrix. The reality-bending effect of bullet time opened up the potential to illuminate the otherwise imperceptible, rippling bullet trails amidst superhuman feet. What the hell? In the wake of this, games employing similar time-bending mechanics were inevitable. And perhaps the most notable was Remedy's neo-noir Max Payne in 2001. The titular character is an undercover cop stricken by the death of his family and the prime suspect in a murder he didn't commit. A desperate man whose exoneration lies behind thousands of angry mobsters. Max faces insurmountable odds, surviving only on copious amounts of painkillers while flinging himself into situations of reckless self-endangerment. Serious Sam, the first encounter, is altogether less serious in tone, despite what the title might indicate. Your starting revolver quickly finds a partner during the first level, although these are quickly replaced as the level of firepower required ramps up dramatically. The stylish Devil May Cry features Demon Hunter Dante tackling the supernatural with aplomb, with the help of his two contrasting sidearms, Ebony and Ivory. In a similar vein, cinema saw a stylish action injection in 2002 with Equilibrium where Christian Bale plays a dystopian cleric tasked with removing errant emotion through perfectly choreographed Gun Carter. The similarly cinematic Max Payne returned in 2003, with the sequel adding some degrees of polish and documenting Max's ever-loosening grasp on reality. The fall of Max Payne was perhaps more than subtext. It would be almost another decade until the third game would emerge. Bungie's highly anticipated follow-up to Halo Combat Evolved came in 2004, and saw the introduction of both Xbox Live multiplayer and new maps and weapons, including the ability to dual wield. Given Master Chief's superhuman strength, it seems fitting that he has the potential to use two of the smaller weapons at once, although it does still carry an accuracy penalty and denies the use of your grenades. Bungie were amongst the first to introduce dual wielded weapons to the world of FPS, and in the decade between Marathon and Halo 2, the convention had firmly established itself. Once upon a time, the Call of Duty series took historical accuracy seriously, with the World War II setting providing enough intrinsic drama without the need to resort to theatrics. In 2005, Call of Duty 2 Big Red One was technically the first in the series to add dual-wielded weapons, 
although this was only within the multiplayer component. With the arrival of the current gen consoles, dual wielding had become commonplace, firmly cemented into culture after a decade of dual depiction. Perhaps a sign that things had come full circle, 2007 saw the release of John Woo's Stranglehold, directly following the events of Hard Boiled and starring all of the acrobatic gunplay you would expect. Chao Yun Fat reprises his role as Tequila, and the game is an unabashed tribute to the choreographed shootouts that inspired so many imitations. Zombies are similarly cliché, and we saw a meeting of the undead with the impractical in Valve's Left for Dead in 2008, where picking up a second pistol effectively doubles your firepower against the oncoming horde. Inspired by Grindhouse-era cinema, 2009's Wet took a Tarantino-esque approach to gunplay, blending dual pistols with a katana. The same year saw dual wielding return to the Call of Duty series, with Modern Warfare 2 abandoning commitment to realism and instead adopting an amped-up Hollywood tack. The power of the pre-patched dual model 1887 shotguns is of a legend, and you could equip two of every other pistol, machine pistol or SMG. Nobody was left wanting for firepower in this instalment. Not to be outdone, Bayonetta took dual wielding to an unprecedented level, with the titular character firing four custom-made pistols from each of her limbs. A superhuman feat beyond the ability of any mundane character. Since Modern Warfare 2, Akimbo has been a recurring feature in the Call of Duty series. Black Ops pistols were equipable in pairs, alongside the unusual HS-10 bullpup shotgun. Modern Warfare 3 had the infamous FMG-9s, with such tremendous lead output trumping any form of precision shooting. More recently, Max Payne 3 took the series' signature gunplay to Sao Paulo, the Brazilian heat mirroring the intense firefights only tempered by brief stints of bullet time. Gearbox's Borderlands 2 the same year introduced the Gun Zerker class, able to wield any two of the quadrillions of weapons on offer simultaneously. Counter-Strike has long had a token set of dual pistols, and Global Offensive has the dual Berettas available as a secondary option. Not a top-tier weapon, but handy enough in a close-range firefight. From its origins in real life, where pulling another pistol was far faster than a painfully slow reload, dual wielding made its way into cinema through the western genre. From there, it inspired emerging action films tailored for a blockbuster audience and directors like John Woo helped cement the use of guns akimbo into popular culture. With the emergence of the FPS genre at around the same time, it didn't take long for doubled up gunplay to become commonplace, and it has been a familiar sight ever since. There's no doubting the fact that it looks cool, and when paired with slow motion a la bullet time, the bilateral badassery becomes quite palpable. While its effect might be muted throughout the use, there's still a certain satisfaction to be had by recklessly blasting two barrels worth of lead towards an opponent. A feat that's perhaps not superhuman, but certainly a spectacle. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, farewell.